Welcome to the exam room live. I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for joining us right here on YouTube and on Facebook. Greatly appreciate you sharing a little bit of your Wednesday with us. At this difficult time in our country, Dr. Neil Barnard will be here with us to examine racial and food inequities in our communities and the health challenges that are a direct result of systemic racism. Dr. Barnard, looking forward to speaking with you. Likewise. Talk to you soon. And a woman who is helping to lead the crusade against breast cancer, a renowned surgeon and best-selling author, Dr. Christy Funk is with us today. Let's beat breast cancer, Chuck. All right, and we're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag, answering your questions live on air. So if there is something that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post it in the comments section now. We'll be getting to that in just a little bit. But first, let's get a quick check on headlines. The number of Americans who have died from the coronavirus is now more than 108,000, with more than 1.8 million cases now confirmed in the U.S. since the beginning of the pandemic. That's two and a half times more than the next leading country. Meanwhile, at least 15 states are experiencing an uptick in the average number of cases over the last five days. Massachusetts, Arizona, and Tennessee among those experiencing the biggest inclines, according to records kept by Johns Hopkins. Tyson Foods says more than a quarter of its employees at a pork processing plant in Storm Lake, Iowa, have tested positive for the coronavirus, but most are asymptomatic. The plant is expected to resume production today after being temporarily shut down. Tyson also says 224 employees at its Council Bluffs, Iowa facility have tested positive. Nationwide, 44 meatpacking workers and four USDA inspectors have died from COVID-19. And finally, a new study finds more than half of adults in Ireland have been drinking more since the beginning of the pandemic. 32% they've been having just an extra drink every now and again, but 22% admit their drinking has increased significantly. As for why, the top reasons given are anxiety and simply having more time on their hands. Alcohol consumption has been linked to a number of forms of cancer, including breast cancer, and we'll be discussing more on that later when Dr. Funk joins us here on the exam room. Right now, though, I want to welcome Dr. Barnard back to the show. And Dr. Barnard, as we continue to look at the inequities and the challenges that are facing the African-American communities, one of the issues that we have worked hard to address is bringing healthy foods into what are known as food deserts, where high quality food is in short supply. Now, from a lay perspective, without access to these high quality, nutritious foods, it seems to me that the risk of so many diseases would just go sky high. Uh, you got it. Actually, let me show you a map. Uh, we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. And can you see this? This is the map of Washington. Is that, yep. is that on your screen? OK, um, where I am sitting now is uh, on this map on the upper left. You see that green splotch? That's what we call Ward 2. And wards uh, two and three, I'm sorry, that's ward three. Um, and th this is one of the more economically advantaged uh, parts of town. And the R that you see is the rate, the rate of colon cancer incidence per 100,000 people per year. So in ward three, where I am now, 22 people develop colon cancer per 100,000 population every single year. In the bottom, uh, that sort of golden color, that's ward eight. You see the R73. So in contrast to 22 per 100,000 in Ward 3 and Ward 8, it's 73 per 100,000. So why is it more than three times higher uh, in Ward 8, uh, which is a more disadvantage compared to Ward uh, 3, which is more advantage? Well, looking overall, this is the whole United States. These are graphs of colon cancer deaths. And as you can see, they're going down, generally speaking. This is women. This is men. But the red line on top is African-Americans. So that although the rates are generally getting better, there's still this enormous disparity between African-Americans and uh, the other uh, racial groups. Uh, one other particularly worrisome statistic is that among people below age 50, the curve doesn't look like this at all. It's actually getting worse and worse and worse. It's going up. So, all right, why? Is it genetics? Is it something else? Well, if we look at colon cancer prevalence among rural South Africans, 
it's about five per hundred thousand, but in African Americans, it's about 65 per hundred thousand. So researchers have long reasoned that it has to do not with genetics, but with foods that are marketed uh, and sold to, to uh, depending on the culture where you live. And Stephen O'Keefe, who is a researcher in Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, did an interesting study. He recruited a group of individuals in Pittsburgh and a group of individuals in rural Africa. Everyone was black and everyone had their own uh, food preferences. But what he asked them to do was for two weeks trade diets so that people who were living in Pittsburgh and used to eating cheese, meat, chicken, these kinds of things, started eating root vegetables and beans and foods that were more customary in the rural areas of South Africa. But And meanwhile, the South Africans did exactly the opposite. They were asked for a two-week period to start eating chicken and beef and cheese and things that were really not their cultural norm. What happened? Within two weeks time, the gut microbiomes completely changed. Those people who started eating healthier foods got healthier. Those people who were eating the unhealthy foods got unhealthier. The gut changed and cholesterol levels change, weight starts to change, all these things start to change and they change fast. So these are the foods that are marketed here where I live in Washington, DC. These are unhealthy foods. So what's this about? Is this just about the way, we, way we've uh, made choices? I'm gonna argue that policy has a lot to do with it and politics. In 2009, we, at the, we meaning the Physicians Committee, proposed that Americans eat from what we're gonna call the power plate, fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. We proposed this to the US government as a replacement for the pyramid. We didn't hear back. So in 2011, we filed a lawsuit against the US government saying, you must respond. And in 2011, the US government did respond and they adopted a plate, I'm happy to say, and it looks rather like what we proposed, except you'll notice a couple of things. Instead of legumes, beans, they said protein, which could be meat, uh, could, could be beans, but could also be meat of various kinds. And they threw in a dairy group, despite the fact that people who avoid dairy are just as healthy or healthier than people who avoid it. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, the people who consume it. You get the idea. Um, they're putting meat and they're putting dairy into this diagram, which these are not needed. And there's another government policy, the SNAP program, it used to be called food stamps, the, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Now SNAP is a good idea. At, when this program was first launched years ago, there was such a thing as starvation in the United States. And the SNAP program has been vital. It has put food on the plate. That's great. That should never be threatened. However, a SNAP retailer, because of the way the law is written, can take your SNAP card and sell you just about anything. I'm talking about bacon and sausage and candy and, and sodas and junk. And this is the kind of thing that is sold in a SNAP retailer. Um, the US government in 2015 started looking at diet quality of SNAP recipients. These are people who may be economically challenged. They sign up for the program hoping to get healthy foods and what happens? The blue bar is SNAP participants, and that's the empty calories in their diet, 34%. The red is income eligible non-participants, meaning they're economically not any better off, but they didn't sign up for SNAP. They do better. They have less in the way of empty calories. The yellow line is higher income people. They do better still. This is your general diet quality. And again, the blue is SNAP, the, the red is uh, people who are equally economically disadvantaged but didn't sign up for SNAP. The SNAP Participants have the worst diets. What I'm suggesting is that we ought to do something different. In 2017, we at the Physicians Committee worked with the American Journal of Preventive Medicine to propose a totally new plan, which is called Healthy Staples. And it's simply this, that a SNAP retailer should be able to provide for you fruits and grains and vegetables and beans. And they shouldn't get a SNAP dollar for a soda or a Velveeta or junk, uh, or for, for that matter, meat. Uh, and there's no reason why, that we can't, why we can't provide healthy foods for everybody. Now, the American Medical Association, I am proud to tell you, has weighed in in a really good way. This goes back 13 years ago, 2007. The AMA resolved, see that number two, that food assistance programs should be providing 
vegetarian foods, healthful non-dairy beverages. Read that. This is AMA policy for school lunches and food assistance programs. Uh, 10 years later, they weighed in on what hospitals should be providing. Hospitals should provide plant-based meals. They should get rid of the processed meat. That means throw out the bacon, throw out the sausage. Now, in 2018, the AMA weighed in once again and said, we need to indicate in federal policies that meat is optional. It's not required. Dairy products are optional. You do not have to have them. This is official policy. Okay, back to cancer. We have talked many times about cancer rates being linked to diet. One of the big contributors are the very foods that, that uh, unfortunately are promoted in U.S. policies, meat and especially dairy products. This is back in the District of Columbia. If you look at who dies of cancer, African-Americans die at more than twice the rate compared to whites. Um, the American Medical Association weighed in and said, we've got to do something about dairy products. Dairy products contribute to prostate cancer. But right now, there is a law that says that if a child, I'm, I'm talking about, about a child who's going through the lunch line and they offer him a glass of milk or a curtain of milk and he says, I can't take that. I'll take almond milk, I'll take soy milk, I'll take anything, don't give me the, 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 the cow's milk products. That sh the school is not legally allowed to offer an alternative to cow's milk unless the child brings a note from a parent or a doctor saying that he's got a disability or a medical condition. The, the AMA recognized that that is racist and needs to stop. If we stop marketing unhealthy foods to kids, they can grow up to be adults who can live well. Last thing I just wanna share with you, breast cancer is uh, same story. Here are figures right here from the District of Columbia. This is the breast cancer deaths per 100,000 population right here in the city of Washington, DC. And as you can see for whites, 20.7 per 100,000, African-Americans, 31.1. And here's the map um, right up there at the top. As you can see, compare that to the, over to the right-hand side in the bottom. Uh, where the economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, again, are dying at the quickest rate. Can we, can we stop this? We can absolutely stop it. It has to do with changing policies that whether they intended to or not, are killing people. Thank you, Chuck, back to you. Certainly a lot to unpack there. And I just wanna segue right into opening up the doctor's mailbag because the question today really goes hand in hand with what it is that you were just discussing. It comes to us from Kunj on Facebook who writes, Dr. Barnard, what changes do you wanna see in the world in the next few years? Does that question come with a magic wand, Chuck? <laughs> Unfortunately <laughs> not. If, if I had one, I would do a few things. Um, I, I think what I would probably try to do is to change fundamental motivations. Um, when I talked about school lunch programs and so forth, they are influenced in large measure by economic interests that want their products to be sold, the dairy industry, the meat industry, the candy industry, all these weigh in heavily. I would like to have, at the, at the risk of sounding like a dreamer, I would like to have our primary motivation here in the United States and everywhere in the world, if we could do this, I would like it to not be greed, but to be compassion. And if that's for people, that would be great. We would treat people the way we would like to be treated. If that's for the environment that we share, that would be good. And if that's for the animals who are currently on our plates, and if we could give them a reprieve, get them off the plate, frankly, we'd all be better off. All right. Dr. Barnard, I greatly appreciate it. And if you have a question, keep them coming in the comment section. We're going to be opening up the mailbag a little bit later on in the show once again with Dr. Funk. So post your questions now, keep them coming, and we will try to get to them before the end of the show. Right now, though, let's move on. One out of every eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. It is truly an alarming number. We're talking about our mothers, our sisters, our wives, our daughters. All of them are facing these odds. But my next guest says that there are steps that you can take right now to dramatically decrease your risk of cancer and increase your risk of leading a healthy, cancer-free life. And so with that, we welcome acclaimed author of Breasts, the Owner's Manual, Dr. Christy Funk, to the exam room live. Dr. Funk, it is so good to have you here today. Chuck, thanks for having me. 
So we at the Physicians Committee and you are kind of the four person for all of this have put together what we call the Let's Beat Breast Cancer Campaign. And that is a four pronged approach to beating breast cancer. And I want to ask you about those steps in just a little bit. But we just saw the rate of breast cancer among African-American women here in the District of Columbia. What do we know about the rates nationwide? Is it similar to what Dr. Barnard shared? It's very similar. So when we look at the national databases, we divide race into five categories. So non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, Hispanics, Asians and Pacific Islanders, and Alaska Native American Indian. So those are our five categories. When you look at incidence, the number of people getting breast cancer every single year across a lifetime, whites get first place but they're followed closely, just right on their heels, big 3% less over a lifetime are the blacks. 30% below those two races are all of the others. Now, despite the fact that whites and blacks have fairly similar, whites a little more, incidence of breast cancer, blacks are 30% more likely to die from their breast cancers, which are the DC stats that Dr. Barnard just displayed, 31% mortality rate versus 20% blacks versus whites for the DC area, pretty parallel to the nation as a whole. And when you compare blacks to the other nationalities, they are literally 150% more likely than Asians to die of their breast cancer and twice as likely, 100% more likely for the other races. So while by no means does breast cancer just target blacks and whites and all races matter, I do want to focus on this inequity, this disparate number of incidents versus mortality in the whites versus blacks to really understand maybe why and if there's a way to penetrate through that why to get to a let's stop and reverse this trend. So go ahead. Yeah, well, my question is, you're quoting these statistics. I'm, I'm curious, are these raw numbers or is this per, say, every 100,000 uh, people? The, the percentages are raw numbers. Uh, so uh, like a 30% increase in death over whites translates into a 30. So for easy math, it's a 30 per 100,000 for blacks right. die versus 20 for 100,000 for whites. So the difference between 20 per and 30 per is a 30% increase in blacks. Right. God, that That is just staggering to me, astronomical. And I know that there are so many you know, things here at play that are really driving why the divide is what it is right now. And there are so many steps that we all need to take to really close that gap because frankly, it's not fair and it is racist and that's, we need to do better. That's what it boils down to, Dr. Funk, is we need to do better. So let's talk about some ways right now that women can actually try to do a little bit better. Let's talk about the four-pronged approach that we put together as part of the Let's Beat Breast Cancer campaign. The first prong on there is choosing a plant-based diet. We heard Dr. Barnard earlier in the show talk a little bit about why that's important. Can you elaborate on that specific to breast cancer? Yes, for sure. So when you think about food, you're just thinking about some bite of mixed rice and vegetables, maybe a piece of meat, and you're chewing it up and swallowing. Your cells do not see that as a bite. It is broken down it's into its component parts, into micronutrients, and for the fruits and veggies and legumes you just swallowed, into phyto, plant-based chemicals or nutrients. And it all goes into your bloodstream and courses through your body and saturates every single cell like a little bathtub that those cells are sitting in. And those nutrients are either screaming out pro-cancer or anti-cancer. So every time you lift work to mouth, you are making a conscious or unconscious choice about what kind of fuel, what kind of little bathtub you're creating for these cells. And I'll tell you, whenever you are consuming animal protein and animal fat, be it from meat or dairy or eggs, you are elevating estrogen levels. Estrogen feeds and fuels 80% of all breast cancers. You're elevating growth factors, in particular IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, which is the big daddy of them all, these messengers that run around in your body and say, grow, 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 which is great when you're a kid and need to grow tall, or when your job for the day, which it is, is to turn over 50 trillion cells, like your stomach cell linings and skin cells, et cetera. But what what happens when that job is done and there's an excess of IGF-1? Well, it's just screaming grow, 
grow cancer, grow into a definable wad of tumor, grow into the bloodstream, grow into the liver, the brain, the bones. Whew, somebody's got to slow that IGF-1 down. And it turns out that you're the somebody because the counterbalance to that, the only way you skyrocket your IGF-1 is to consume an excess of animal protein and animal fat, particularly the protein. So by eliminating or limiting your consumption of meat and dairy, you're going to drop your estrogen levels. You're going to drop the IGF-1. You're going to drop other things that happen with an excess of meat and dairy as well, particularly angiogenesis, angio blood vessel genesis creation. Tumor cells create blood flow to them to bring the nutrients they need. They're so sinister, but fruits and vegetables are anti-angiogenic, whereas meat and dairy create that blood flow. You're going to hit your immune system and create inflammation. And ultimately meat and dairy have big contributions to this battle inside of us called oxidative stress. On the flip side, fruits and vegetables and legumes all are antioxidants. So meat and dairy are oxidants, tearing things down, creating oxidative stress, creating immune function that is impaired and therefore cancer cells are allowed to flourish. Fruits and vegetables, antioxidants win the battle almost every time. There's an amazing study that will encourage our viewers to make small changes. You don't have to like, you know, hightail it to the fridge and dump out every bit of meat and dairy in there. I wish you would, but that's hard for a lot of people and understandably so. There's a lot of addictive qualities to those foods that are purposely put in there. Nevertheless, let me tell you a quick study well, quickly tell you about a study that will transform your eating forever. I guarantee it. So a study took 50, 150 men and women and fed them a standard American diet for breakfast. We're steak and eggs, pancakes and bacon, um, and had their LDL cholesterol, which is a measure of that oxidative stress I alluded to, had their LDL checked hourly, up, 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 lunch, hamburger and fries, up, 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 dinner. So Hour after hour, their oxidative stress, their oxidized cholesterol goes up and up. They're going to bed with fewer antioxidants than when they woke up. Same people, next day, same sad standard American diet, breakfast or lunch, but one change, one change, a cup of strawberries. LDL, breakfast, up, up, down, down, baseline. Hamburger, a cup of strawberries, up, up, down, down, baseline the power in food, the phytonutrients that get into that bloodstream, combat the negative effects of that animal-based meal so readily that you're back to baseline a few hours later. But what if, what if the meal itself had been total plant power, had been steel cut oats and blueberries, right? Or an amazing smoothie blended with vegetables and fruits and some soy milk. Then that oxidative stress, which is created by any kind of meal, would be so quick, boop, boop, little blip. And now what are these antioxidants going to do all for the next three hours until your next meal? They're going to run around and create that bathtub of anti-cancer, of lowering all of your chances, not only of cancer, it turns out, but of all major killers, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, Alzheimer's. So for sure, the number one prong in our four-pronged fork approach to breast cancer is to eat a whole foods plant-based diet. You know, that is the second time I've heard you talk about that strawberry study. And I'm just as floored by it today as I was back in February, last October now. I mean, it's just like, it's such an incredible study. You said like, it will change the way that you eat forever. No kidding. Like that, that is a big time deal. Let's look at the second uh, prong on the four pronged approach. And this is something that I think that a lot of people across the board are struggling with right now, especially during the lockdown, because we're so sedentary, moving, exercising. How important is that in terms of lowering the risk of breast cancer? It's incredibly important. When you're active, you're going to decrease estrogen levels, improve inflammation, and ultimately set the stage for that oxidative stress to be in your favor. It is an oxidative stressful situation to exercise, but the post-exercise benefits are massive. One of my favorite studies to quote, because it's so easy for you to implement, you're like, really, that's it? I can do that. It looked at over 17,000 women and followed them over a number of 10 years and looked at exercise as one of the variables. Those women who literally walked one hour and 15 minutes a week 
dropped breast cancer by 18%. I mean, that's nothing. I mean, that's like 12 minutes a day and you're dropping your breast cancer risk. So just briskly walking and chatting with a cup of coffee in hand with a friend, I guess through a mask right now, will improve breast cancer. But what if you got a little pep in your step? If you really vigorously work out, like super sweaty, it's not so easy to talk while you're doing so, 30 to 40% drop in breast cancer risk. So there's no question that exercise has tremendous benefits. So while we're cooped up, if you're really cooped up in your house, you know, maybe get one of those DVD workouts or a Peloton kind of situation where you're able to really push the workout to sweaty levels. You only need two and a half hours a week to get those benefits I mentioned. If you're more of a power walker or even, let's just face it, you like to saunter and don't walk fast at all, five hours a week will do the trick. All right. This next one, we kind of talked about in headlines a little bit. We heard that more than half of all adults in Ireland are drinking more since the pandemic began. When it comes to the risk of breast cancer, probably not the best idea. What is the connection here? So there are a few connections between alcohol and breast cancer risk. By the way, it's probably not just our Irish sisters that are upping the ante with their alcohol intake, as we do know from stats around the, around the world and in the U.S., First of all, what's a drink? A drink is 1.5 ounces of hard liquor, it's 12 ounces of beer, is five ounces of wine. So pick your poison, get it in mind, ready? A drink a day increases breast cancer by 10%, two drinks a day, 30%, three drinks a day, 40%, and upward from there. So what is happening, Chuck, is a little few things. First of all, alcohol consumption generally increases estrogen levels. And as mentioned, estrogen is the fuel source for 80% of all breast cancers. So you're giving those cancer cells more of the food they need to multiply and divide. Number two, alcohol impairs immune function. Immune cells are supposed to say, hey, you're a traitor, you're a rogue cell, you need to either be altered back to normal or get put out of this body. So your immune system defenses are lower. Thirdly, you create a highly potent carcinogen whenever you drink alcohol called acetaldehyde that your liver then has to deal with. But if you were just to use alcohol as a mouthwash, put it in your mouth, spit it out, you already created acetaldehyde that's going to get swallowed down. And then the final driver toward cancer formation when it comes to alcohol is the inactivation of an enzyme called MTHFR. Kind of sounds like a bad word, but it's got a better name when it's all pulled out. MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, converts folic acid into methylfolate. Methylfolate runs around and fixes DNA when it goes awry. But whenever you drink alcohol, you inhibit that enzyme from functioning. So you're not gathering up that methylfolate weapon that you need to reverse cancer cells. And the last of the four prongs, it seems like it just kind of comes automatically after you implement the first three steps here. And that is getting to and maintaining a healthy body weight. And you will get to that healthy body weight naturally if you are pretty re uh, regimented in following a whole food plant-based diet, getting daily exercise, limiting alcohol to say a drink or less daily, which is what the American Cancer Society recommends for women, two drinks for men, but less is more. And by the way, no non-drinker should start drinking alcohol, claiming some sort of cardiac or breast benefits and red wine, which arguably might be there. So when it comes to weight, if you're following the other three, those pounds will naturally fall off. But to incentivize you, not to scare you, if you think about the weight you were in high school and then the weight you are now, if you are plus or minus eight pounds from that weight, you're our null group. You're the no increase in risk. But if you've gained between eight and 14 pounds since high school, you just increase breast cancer risk by 25%. And if you gain between 14 and 29 pounds, you increase breast cancer by 60%, more than 29 pound weight gain, and you doubled your risk of breast cancer. The good news, however, is that if you lose your weight, you lose your risk. The earlier in life you lose it, the more risk ben um, benefits, the less risk you assume. But even postmenopausal weight loss, it all matters to dramatically drop breast cancer risks. So get to your ideal body mass index, BMI. Look for a uh, pinklotus.com has a great calculator there. But BMI is simply using your height and weight to determine what your ideal range is. And that's 18.5 to 24.9. If you're underweight, good for you. You get to eat a little more than the rest of us and gain some weight. But those who are overweight, which sadly is 72% of all Americans, 
you really should employ these strategies to get yourself back into that ideal body weight. All right. Now, if you have a question for Dr. Funk, post it right now in the comment section. We're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. But Dr. Funk, as those questions come in, I want to ask you about, you know, some of the patients that you've seen over the years. I'm sure that once someone has gone into remission, they have gone on to do some incredible things in their life. Are there, you know, some patients who you've worked with that you've just seen just so flourish? Like, I just feel like we could use a little bit of inspiration right now in such a difficult time. Tell us a good story about somebody who's come out the other side and is just doing extraordinary things right now. Okay, great. So I'll call her Carol. And uh, when I met Carol, she was definitely overweight, drinking too much, unhappy in her marriage, and had been diagnosed, thankfully, with a favorable subtype of cancer because it was estrogen driven as opposed to the estrogen negative cancers, which incidentally, blacks have a 21% chance of getting a triple negative, very aggressive, harder to cure cancer, as opposed to 10% of whites and 12% of other races. So that's one reason why uh, in, in a genetic level, it's a higher mortality rate for the blacks, but it, it goes deeper than that into socioeconomic levels and even political spheres. Back to Carol. So she came to see me and we talked about the strategy to treat and cure her breast cancer. For her, it required um, surgery and radiation, no chemotherapy, and can, an anti-estrogen pill because her cancer was fueled. So we had to take a pill that would hit that receptor and inactivate it. All right, what else can I do, doc? Well, I'll tell you, before I wrote Breast the Owner's Manual, I would have a few tidbits to have given her. Now that I really dove into nutritional science and lifestyle medicine and understand the dramatic impact it has against future recurrence for breast cancer, she got more than an ear for a year full from me. So we went through it one by one. Let's talk about your weight. Okay, let's calculate your BMI. How many pounds do you have to lose? How are you going to lose it? And we talked about nutrition. We talked about exercise. We talked about stress management. Using Tai Chi or yoga or meditation to decrease stress literally has a mind-body connection. That body inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, uh, C-reactive protein, these things have been measured in people. High stress, high inflammation, high cancer risk. Less stress, less markers, less recurrence. So <clears throat> we talked about stress management and we talked about our marriage. We talked about love and relationships and how much they impact survival. The LACE study, Life After Cancer Epidemiology study, followed 2,200 early stage, just like Carol, early stage breast cancer patients for 10 years. And in that period of time, those who reported out low, not high, low levels of social support and low levels of religious affiliation had a 58% increase in death from breast cancer. That's how important relationships are. She got into marital counseling and now it's been four years. This story is now four years later. She is in her ideal body weight. She's still happily married to her husband. They kind of resolve all of their, well, I don't want to say, I don't want to speak for her. I'm sure there's still a little, he may still leave the toilet seat up, but they resolve their major conflicts. And she is meditating every single day, taking walks on the beach and there's no sign of cancer. I taught her about these anti-estrogenic foods that you can eat that act like tamoxifen and arimidex, these drugs that women have to, don't have to, but they should take um, to help combat cancer. So we talked all about cruciferous vegetables and soy and um, citrus fruits, flax seeds, and she's consuming all of those on a daily basis and feels empowered because she knows that this life now is filled with choices and those choices are allowing her to maximize her enjoyment of every aspect of life. Disease minimization just being one aspect. She's so much richer and deeper in her friendships and her relationships with her kids and with her husband. Oh man, that is outstanding. I needed to hear something good and you delivered right there. I mean, big time. Uh, questions. This is one from Lori, who I think, man, this is something that a lot of us can identify with. She writes, I try to eat plant-based and healthy as much as I can. And I understand how important it is, but I still eat junk at times like potato chips and sometimes cheese. I don't really want to eat this food, but I also feel like I'm addicted to it. Do you have any tips to help break that addiction? 
I have a few tips. So number one, don't have that food in the house. I know you're probably like, duh, I know, but it was on sale even. So just don't though. Don't have that food in the house. If you've really got to put on clothes that other people can see, <laughs> depending on uh, what time of day or night it is and whether or not you're sheltering at home right now and get in a car and drive to a grocery store just to satisfy that hankering for salty chips, that can be an impediment. So don't have the chips at home, number one. Number two, have something that is an acceptable alternative to you. That might be hummus and vegetables or some lightly salted or unsalted nuts, which are very filling because of the fat content. So just have some handy snacks that you know you like that do satiate you and make you happy. You're not being derogatory or like self deprecating to say that you, these foods are addictive. They are. There are literally jobs that exist in these large companies of processed food makers. Their job is to make this particular potato chip more addictive, just the right amount of salt, the right amount of fat so that you can never put down the bag till it's empty. So don't feel alone in that. I mean, they're, they're, that is uh, a job well done by those guys, if that's how you're feeling. But the biggest things are to not have the, the snacks that are cheats for you readily available and then to have something else you can grab that'll make that sensation pass. Down a cup of water too. That's a big one. Just fill your stomach, expand it a little bit. Just change the neurotransmitters in your body by putting in some food and that hankering will pass. All right. Next one comes from Jane. Soy, still controversial in the cancer community. Jane wants to know what are the best sources of soy and how much do you recommend daily, if any? Oh, Jane, I love this question because it shouldn't be controversial in the medical world. It only is because said individuals haven't probably haven't read the most recent science. And by recent, I mean since 2009. So it's even not that recent. There is no controversy if you actually jump into the science. So the healthiest food sources of soy, but by no means do you have to eat these ones, are the fermented soys, tempeh, miso, natto, and tamari sauce. Natto, not palatable for many people, but if you love it, go for it because that is a more digestible fermented soy. The next level is minimally processed soy. And I'll, I'm going to jump into a couple studies just to give you the power of soy in statistics um, as they pertain to breast cancer risk. But in that category, in these studies, they're not talking about the fermented. They're talking about consumption of soy milk, tofu, soybeans, roasted soy nuts. So that is a healthy category as well. The least healthy and really just kind of unstudied is your isolated soy protein that is so extracted from the original soybean that it used to be that we don't know if it carries all of the amazing health benefits that I'm about to enumerate. However, it's definitely going to be better if you have a burger whose main protein source is the isolated soy protein, as opposed to a beef burger, go for it. If that's what you want to have instead of a beef burger, I'm all for the isolated soy protein. Always non-GMO. For those who don't know, organic is always non-GMO, not vice versa, but you just want to make sure you're not getting the excess glyphosate, that Roundup chemical that's so ubiquitous with the soy crops in America. So statistically, there have been a number of amazing studies in humans, not in mice, in humans that show that high versus low soy consumption will lead to about a 60% reduction in getting breast cancer. And if you have breast cancer, there are multi-ethnic studies, and I point that out because if you're thinking, oh, all of the studies must be in Asians because they eat more soy, but maybe it's the green tea, maybe it's the rice, right? No, multi-ethnic American studies included between, they vary, 30 to 60% less breast cancer recurrence and 30% less death from breast cancer in the high versus low soy consumers. How much is high consumption? Some of these studies are one serving a week. I advocate for two to three servings of soy a week, look what a serving is. It might be a half a cup of soy milk, a cup of tofu. Um, a word of caution, excess soy, and that would be in the literature for sure seven servings. So I would cut it off at five or more servings of soy actually creates enough protein to elevate that big daddy actor that I don't like IGF one. So two to three servings of soy come beyond healthy and completely safe. Question from Melody on YouTube. Does hormone replacement therapy increase the chance of breast cancer? Melody, yes, it does. So hormone replacement therapy has different studies saying different things, but they all kind of, when you really take a deep look, which I have at the studies, 
they are not contradicting one another. So the big one that hit the world in July 2002 is the Women's Health Initiative. And what that showed us is a 26% increase in breast cancer for those women on a combination of estrogen and progesterone. That was enough to panic the world and literally prescriptions for HRT, hormone replacement therapy, dropped in half. And the very next year, 2003, there was an unprecedented, really unthinkable 6.7% plummet in breast cancer incidence just one year later. And it was predominantly, almost entirely in women over 50 with estrogen driven cancers. In other words, those who had stopped that hormone replacement, that led to a dramatic drop in breast cancer. Other studies, however, look at women who take just estrogen because maybe it's the progesterone component. And if you don't have a uterus and you can just take estrogen, maybe then you don't get an increase in breast cancer. And in point of fact, those studies showed a drop in breast cancer by about 25%. However, and here's the rub, here's where the increase comes in. You get an increase even with estrogen only if it's taken within the first five years of going through menopause. Hello, that's when you're hot flashing your way to a divorce and need to take the hormone replacement. Or if you take it for longer than 10 years duration, those two elevate breast cancer risk. So then your next question, I can already hear you, Melody, is what about bioidenticals? Because they're made from healthy things like soy and yams. And while that sounds breast cancer protective and healthy, there are no studies to show us one way or another. And you just don't know what happens to those compounds when they went from a yam to a cream or a pill and have been so altered that maybe the phytoestrogen benefits are mutated in some way and actually become dangerous. We just don't know because the studies aren't there. So I would encourage each woman to have an individualized conversation with her doctors about whether their risks outweigh their benefits. If you have had a personal history of breast cancer, you have a high family history of breast cancer, if you have dense breasts, HRT is gonna make that density even denser and that's a risk factor for breast cancer. You weigh that against other risks, such as taking HRT in certain populations, not everybody, those who already have heart disease, HRT will worsen it and increase cardiac death. But if you have no heart disease, um, it can be protective against heart disease. So it's very nuanced and complicated, this conversation. But by and large, to answer the question, yes, HRT absolutely increases breast cancer. But as an individual, you need to balance that risk out. And why are you taking it? Because if it's for hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, insomnia, mood swings, those things, there are alternatives available. Acupuncture is really helpful. Increasing soy consumption. My absolute favorite is menopause miracle. It literally deserves its name. It works in over 90% of women to eliminate all 12 of the major menopause symptoms while increasing bone density. So check into alternatives before you check out that prescription that your doctor gave you. All right. And my final question to you is this, the current rate of breast cancer among women is one out of every eight. If every woman were to implement the four prongs that we've talked about today on the show, what then would the rate of breast cancer become in your estimation? Uh, it, our worst case scenario would be one in four. We would drop that number by 50%. And best case, we could drop it by 80 to 90%. That is outstanding. All right, Dr. Funk, coming up October 3rd and 4th in Southern California, you've got the Cancer Kicking Summit. Talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, I'm so excited. So this summit is live at the gorgeous Oceanfront Terranea Resort in Palos Verdes, California, but it's also available on on-demand video. And what we're going to do, ladies is and men, if you'd like to come, you're more than welcome. We're going to deep dive into the soil of your life and we're going to root around in there and throw out all the things that are not contributing to your healthy life. And we're going to plant what I call an orchard of life that helps you live your most fruitful, bountiful existence. And we're going to look at things like thinking. Why do you think the way you do? Tell yourself the things that you tell yourself about yourself. I'm overweight. I've always been this way. I'm a smoker. That's just who I am. We're going to look at diet and nutrition. You bet we are. We're going to look at exercise, meditation, all sorts of actionable, start right now, powerful things that you can implement in your life so that you can emerge the most successful, beautiful, confident, contributing member of society that you've ever dream that you could be. So please join me. Check out pinklotus.com forward slash summit to learn more. I would love to see you there or see you on demand. Yeah. And I bet the food there is going to be out of this world, isn't it? 
you bet it is. I'm going to show you <laughs> just how to I mean, that's one of the things actually I love. So people say, I, I would eat plant-based, but it's so boring. It's so bland. And part of that is your taste buds were hijacked and we need a moment to just like less salt and things like that. But let me tell you, if you come live to this conference, you will be blown away by how utterly delicious plants can be. And you can learn how to make that. I've got my cancer kitchen. My cancer kicking kitchen is opening soon with countless recipes and how-tos. So don't miss that either. You can sign up now for it so you know when it goes live. All right. And you can get jump started on everything. You don't have to wait until October. You can head over to Amazon or your favorite book retailer online, pick up a copy of Dr. Funk's book, Breasts, The Owner's Manual. Dr. Funk, thank you so very much for your time. This has just been fantastic. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Thanks for doing All what you do. Absolutely. We'll talk to you again soon. I am certain of that. All this week, we want to take some time to encourage everyone to learn about the health disparities that we've been talking about on the show. Talk about racism, learn about it, and most importantly, take a stand. And one of the great ways that you can do that is by listening to those who are speaking out about these issues and sharing their message. And so today we would like to spotlight Trio plant-based restaurant in Minneapolis. This place is just extraordinary. Founded in 2018, Trio was built on a foundation of racial justice and it happens to be Minnesota's first black owned 100% plant-based restaurant. So at a time when challenges and injustices in the community have rubbed raw the emotions of all who live there, Trio is giving away food to the residents there so that they may feel a little comfort as their wounds continue to heal. You can visit them online at trioplantbased.com or stop by their store at 610 West Lake Street in Minneapolis. And that's going to do it for us today. Remember, we are going to be right back here tomorrow at noon Eastern. Tracy McWhorter, the ageless vegan, will be with us to talk about her incredible campaign, 10,000 Black Vegan Women. It's going to be extraordinary. And also tomorrow, there's going to be a brand new episode of the Exam Room podcast. So head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever shows are available. Go ahead and subscribe there. You can also check out my full series that we did with Dr. Funk from last year, all about Let's Beat Breast Cancer. You thought we took a deep dive today. Oh, no, no, no. We just barely scratched the surface. There are five phenomenal episodes in that series that I highly encourage everyone to check out. Plus in the archive, tons of interviews with Dr. Barnard and then dignitaries like Drs. T. Colin Campbell and Michael Greger. A lot of great content up there that is potentially life-saving. So check that out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher, wherever shows are available. My many thanks to our wonderful producers, Laura Anderson and Donna Steele and our director, Emily Colon. For Dr. Barnard and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for joining us. Until tomorrow, take a stand and keep it plant-based. <laughs>